I'm Janet Nodar. I'm the senior editor for Break Bulk and Project Cargo with the Journal of Commerce and the chair of the annual Journal of Commerce Break Bulk and, Car and Project Cargo Conference. Um, welcome to our session on chartering in the multipurpose vessel market. Our speakers today are Justin Archard in Hamburg and Rob Jacquette in Houston. Justin is co-founder and managing director of One World Shipbrokers, an MPB, MPV focused shipbroker and creator of the new market sentiment index designed to give insight into this market. Before starting the new brokerage, Justin spent many years working for super heavy lift carriers, Jumbo and SAL. Rob is Vice President Commercial at BBC Chartering in Houston, where he heads the Houston Chartering Desk. He's also very involved in BBC's training program for new employees. BBC Chartering is the largest tramp break bulk shipping operator in the world, currently operating about 150 ships. Today, we're talking about MPV chartering and who does what, the relationships integral to this unique business. To give you some context about the fleet itself, According to Drury, a maritime consultancy, there are only, <clears throat> excuse me, there are only about 3,200 multipurpose ships operating. So this is a small, very specialized uh, slice of the global shipping universe. Of these ships, about 2,200 either are not geared, which means they do not have cranes, or they're geared only up to about 100 metric tons of lift capacity. And many of these are deployed in short sea shipping. About 580 ships can lift between 100 metric tons and 250 metric tons, and only about 350 can lift more than 250 metric tons. Very few of these can lift 600, 800, even more metric tons. So that is one qualifying characteristic. But Justin, we'll start with you. Uh, what exactly is a multipurpose vessel and how do they differ from other cargo ships? Well, Thank you, Janet. Um, and first of all, um, thank you for inviting me on. Delighted to be here um, to share this uh, this afternoon with you. Um, Multipurpose ships are um, really they're quite like unlike many other ship types. Um, they're unlike container ships. They're like unlike bulk ships because they know they they vary enormously in their size, uh, their configuration, and their general abilities. But there are some general characteristics which they all or very much pretty much most of them share. Uh, and the first one you touched upon just a second ago is cranes. Uh, most multipurpose vessels, as, as myself and say Rob understands them, are, uh, are gear vessels. Um, they have a number of cranes on board, usually two, quite often three, um, but they, have, uh, they, they all have cranes. Usually they're located on the side of the vessel, either on the port side or the starboard side of the vessel. Sometimes, very rare occasions, you might find them in the middle of the vessel, and in even rarer occasions, you might find them on opposite sides of the vessel. But nevertheless, they have, they have, uh, they have cranes. The second thing that uh, that um, all MPPs uh, share are tween decks. Now, you won't find this necessarily with um, with bulk carriers or container ships, things like that. Uh, tween decks are uh, a, a series of pontoons, of small decks, stages inside the hold, which can be uh, which can be lowered and, and, and raised in order to optimize the amount of space there is in the uh, in the cargo hold to stow your cargo. And because all cargoes are different heights and different lengths uh, in multipurpose, making best use of the space that's available uh, is crucial to uh, to to um, to getting the best paid voyage. Um, what we try to do in multipurpose is try to reduce what is known as broken stowage. And broken stowage is the area of the hold, which is just air, air that you know, air that isn't stowed with cargo. So we call it broken stowage. Minimizing that means that you need to have tween decks that are various heights all the way down through the ship, uh, which allow you to make best use of the space. Uh, and the other thing that uh, that uh, ties a lot of the MPPs together are long box shaped holds. Uh, many of the box ships and other types of ships have many, many bulkheads running down through the ship. An MPP tends to have very long under deck holds, and this again allows you to um, to load uh, and stow um, a vast uh, array of different types of cargoes, whether they come from refineries, petrochemical plants. Some of them are very, very long indeed, pipes, windmill blades, that kind of thing. So that gives us uh, that gives um, MPPs lots of flexibility, and that's what really MPPs are designed to be. They're, they're designed to be very, very flexible. And MPPs tend also to be smaller than uh, a lot of the 
uh, other types of ships. And that's partly based on uh, the fact that they need to get into often uh, smaller ports uh, around the world rather than the big sort of hub ports that uh, that, uh, that, that that the big container ships go, go to. Uh, MPPs often have to go to smaller ports, um, which sometimes have very short piers or they have much, much less water. So that kind of flexibility is uh, is, 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 is important. Um, a lot of uh, uh, project sites are built well away from the um, uh, well away from the city centers. So, uh, you know, road systems aren't able to, uh, to, to, to manage some of these cargoes. So ports are sometimes built just for a project and sometimes they're small and they have lots of constraints. So MPPs are, uh, are, are built with these things in mind. And, and I'd like to just quickly touch upon something which is uh, you, you mentioned also in your introduction, and that is the tramp trades and the liner trades. It's also very important in MPPs. You tend to find that the MPPs operate in the tramp trades more so than the liner trades. And the difference really can be summarized as follows. Uh, the liner trades are a bit like a bus service. A bus service is that there are predetermined stops along the way. You get on at one point, you get off at another, but you have to visit all of the other ports or bus stops along the route. And you know the time that it's going to show up and you know the time that it's going to arrive. Both with, uh, with the, the MPP business and the tram trades, it's a bit like a taxi service. You call them, they come to your they come to your house, they pick you up, they take you where you want to go, often without having to stop anywhere in between. And that's a personal service. And that's more like the MPP world, where we're working on something more like in the tram trades, more like a personal tailored service. So those are the sort of basic differences. All right, thank you very much, very much. Interesting. All right, Rob, next question is for you. Um, what kind of cargoes do multipurpose ships specialize in? Who are, and who are your customers? Yeah, thank you, Janet. Appreciate being uh, invited to participate. So very, very much what Justin just explained. It's very diverse. So, and so is our customer base. Um, a lot of the equipment or cargoes that we're moving are related to the oil and gas in industry where we're moving something like uh, drilling pipe or drilling rigs on the oil and gas side. And on the project side, we start to get into the heavy and long modules, very much like what Justin was referencing, that, that are suited for the long holds, open hatches, uh, tandem cranes to lift specialized heavy pieces. Uh, we're also moving bulk cargo. That's another uh, ability that the ships have being multi-purpose is that you can turn the tween deck pontoons, what Justin was saying, as a vertical position. And you can put bulk inside of the hold and then so maybe create on the, smaller holds, right? That's, that's right. You create a separate compartment. So mm -hmm. you could have, let's just say, 5,000 tons of a bulk cargo midship. And then the aft section, you could start loading uh, pipes going to the same region. And then we have the wind industry that we're moving a lot of windmill blades that they're getting longer and longer these days from 50, mm -hmm. 60, 70, 80, 90 meter long and could be longer in the future. Um, along with their towers, when they're erecting these uh, windmills, they need the towers and the blades, and these are all very long sections. Um, so you could imagine we're having, say, 5,000 tons of bulk with 2,000 tons of pipe, and then on deck you're loading long windmill blades just to try to show the mix and match of the types of cargoes and industries that we're servicing. Uh, we're also moving containers. The vessels are able to transport containers. That's the other pur one of the other purposes they have. So they might not be the most optimal um, container carrier. Right now you're seeing the container capacity is getting larger and larger. Um, as Justin rightly pointed out, ours are a little bit smaller. So these could be used as feeder vessels going maybe from smaller island ports in certain regions where a mother vessel comes in to say the port of Houston, takes out a thousand containers, and then they use the smaller ships such as ours to feed her into smaller ports and areas in say the Caribbean or something like that. Um, another another thing that we move is uh, yachts. Uh, when you have you know, wealthy people that are looking to spend the summer in uh, the Mediterranean and their yachts are in South Florida, they have to figure out how to transport them. And these yachts aren't quite built with the range to sail across uh, oceans. So yeah. they, they will, that's, that's correct. So they'll contract somebody like a, a BBC and we will load their, their yacht and transport it to the Mediterranean for maybe the summer or however they wish to, to, to spend their, <laughs> their time. Um, and the customer bases, we're, we're dealing a lot with the shippers and manufacturers, the engineering companies, the cargo owners. We're also engaging with the freight forwarders as, as they need to be in the process and also brokers. They all bring valuable assets and, and qualities to the industry. 
that uh, we rely on for Intel, um, where the where the rates are going. Maybe that maybe a, a broker can come to us and say, "Hey, I know you already are working this 5,000 tons of bulk, but yeah. I know somebody that has 2,000 tons of pipe, and then I also know that there's going to be a windmill shipment. So maybe they're able to be a little bit more forward and bring more uh, interest to us, so we can maybe be a little bit more competitive when we're offering on the pipe combinations with the blades. Okay. All right. So Justin, let's come to you and then talk a little bit about what's the difference between an owner and an operator of these kinds of ships and how they work together in chartering. And then we can talk to you about being a ship broker and what that is. Okay. 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 Uh, well, imagine, imagine you want to, okay. Best way of being able to describe this is, uh, is uh, imagine you want to rent a house. Uh, we all do from time to time. And you find the house that you like and uh, and you go to the owner and you, you ask them how much the rent is. And the owner says to you, well, OK, uh, it's going to be $100 a month uh, for the rent. And but you must sign up for a minimum of one year to get this price. And you say, well, OK, that's fine. I'll do that. So you rent uh, you rent the house for $100 a month for a year and then you move in and you find you have some some spare rooms and you think to yourself, oh, I wonder what I can do with these spare rooms. I wonder if I can rent them out to a few of my school buddies. So you think, okay, I'll get a few of my school buddies in and maybe the rent that they pay to me will cover the rent I have to pay to the owner. And maybe I get to keep a few dollars as well. Well, you know, shipping works largely on the same principles. An operator may not be an owner. He just rents the ships from an owner and then he tries to find the cargoes and trade the ships at a higher price than he rented the ship for. So when you come to work in shipping, you may be working for an owner you know, who is just renting or chartering his ships to a, an operator, or you may be working for an operator who's trading the ships he has chartered from an owner in the cargo markets. Or in some cases, you might be working from an owner operator, you know, who's a company that not only owns its own ships, but, but, uh, but trades them as well. So those are the sort of the basic differences. So there's lots of different possible combinations of owner, operator, and how they work together, right? I mean, there's oh, enormously. Uh, you know, I mean, without getting without getting too uh, too, too technical to about it, it, it is it is uh, it is an enormously difficult and uh, 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 complex process. Uh, sometimes to unravel exactly who owns a ship, uh, and uh, and that in itself is a, is a discipline all on its own. So really, when it comes to uh, when it comes to thinking about you know, working for a shipping company, you will work in one of those generally speaking, in one of those uh, uh, type of formats, either for an operator, either for an owner or uh, or, or an owner operator hybrid. But that's generally where, where you will find yourself. OK, All right. and then just one quick note. So with BBC Chartering, BBC Chartering is a sister company with Brisa, right, that owns many of the ships that BBC operates. And then BBC also charters in other ships from a range of other owners. Is that correct, Rob? Yes, that, that's how it, Brisa is the main owner of BBC, and so you have the ownership side and the operator side, and it, it is more or less one single company, but there is some separation between the two. And then BBC also is taking on charter vessels from other owners and mm -hmm. operating them uh, in cohesion, cohesion with the Brisa fleet. Okay, right, okay, all right. All right, Rob, so... I mean, Justin, I'm sorry. OK, so mm. let's talk about ship brokers. You're a ship broker. What, right. what do you do? What does that mean? Do you work for the owners? Do you work for the operators? Perhaps well, I, I, I could do, uh, depending on the type of broker that I am. Or, okay. or, uh, but I, I am a, an intermediary. I mean, I'm a competitive broker. OK, first and foremost, I'm, you know, I could be like Rob, for example. And Rob is uh, what we call an owner's broker. Uh, he works on the owner's side. He, he he works to fix his own ships. I am a I am a competitive broker, which means to say is I don't work for anybody in particular. Okay, I'm not on anybody's payroll. I'm on my own payroll. <laughs> um, so I'm an intermediary. You know, and as and as far as chartering is concerned, you know, I I bring shippers and operators together, and I try to facilitate deals which are in the best interest, to, you know, of both sides. So maybe sometimes I'm I'm asked by a shipper. Um, you know, to find a ship, somebody who's got cargo, they want they want me to go out and find them a ship uh, to ship their cargo. I, I can do that. 
And sometimes I'm specifically asked by the operator, like Rob, and Rob says to me, uh, Justin, I've got a ship, you know, I, it's going to be open in, uh, it's going to be available in the in, in, in Houston uh, in, the, in the next week or so. Have you got any cargo for me? And I see if I can go out and find them some cargo. So I can sort of sit in the middle of both sides. And then sometimes I use my creativity when I see cargoes being offered in the market and I think I can find the right ship for that cargo or for the right freight price. Uh, but nobody's actually specifically asked me to do so. It's just something I intuitively try to do. You know, it's a, it's a deal. There's a ship that obviously needs fixing and there's cargo that needs to be shipped. My job is to try to recognize some of those opportunities and, and bring them together. And that's partly, you know, on the chartering side, that's what we do. Then another shipbroken uh, sort of discipline is uh, is when an operator you know wants to rent or charter a ship from an owner, which we just discussed just a minute ago. He may come to me and say, "Look, you know, I you know I want to uh, I want to I want to charter a ship. I want to uh, to work out the details of, you know, where and when it is going to be available and how much is going to cost per day because that's how we price these things on a per day basis." And for how long the charter period will last for, and you know, obviously the overall price. So that's another area of shipbroking that is a very, very important. You can see in, in, in that particular deal, I filled the space between the owner uh -huh. and the operator. And now on the on, on the former with the, with the with the cargo, I filled the space between the operator and the and the shipper. So I can work in both both channels. And, and 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 the other way that is uh, that is that is uh, quite normal for shipbrokers to be involved in is, is is sale and purchase. Ships have to be bought and sold, and they're bought and sold between owners. Um, shipbrokers can uh, have to faci facilitate these deals. They can take a long time to eventuate, and they can involve many many millions of dollars, as you can imagine. So it's very very skilled and and and, and complex work. So. Uh, anybody coming into shipbroking may find themselves in one of those basic disciplines, either chartering broker uh, as a as a as a, a, a ship broker, as it were, and then as a, a sale and purchase broker. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Thank you. That's very interesting. Uh, and you've added a lot of clarity to what what exactly that means. All right, Rob, I'm going to go back to you. Mm -hmm. How do multipurpose operators figure out the freight rates that they charge their customers? And what's included in this beyond the rent, the chartering the rate that operators must pay the ship owners whose ships they're using? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, usually we rely on very wonderful brokers to tell us what the market is first. And then we Thank just you. work backwards from there. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, what, what goes into a voyage and we're offering on cargo is as we're doing a parceling service, uh, and as I was explaining, a 5,000 ton shipment of bulk and 2,000 tons of pipe with a deck load of, of blades, you know, wow. not every one of those cargoes is going to pay for the full voyage because everybody's looking to do a parceling service. Say that cargo is going from Houston to Rotterdam, just as an example. So maybe that voyage cost a million dollars, but not all three customers are willing to pay a million dollars. So we can kind of maybe go to each one and say, well, if you can pay you know, three hundred and fifty or four hundred thousand dollars, and you can do the same, and then we can bring them all together on the same voyage and take them to the same area. So that that's kind of the base version of parceling service versus a one to one. If somebody just had a full load of say ten thousand tons of bulk and had to go straight from Houston to Rotterdam, well, they might have to pay the full million dollars just to try to give a breakdown of parceling sailing versus a a sole cargo. So when we're so running, parceling is, parceling is many different ship could be several different shippers with different bundles or parcels of cargo. That's right, where they're all looking to have cost savings tied to getting their cargo transported to the next destination. Okay. Sometimes that can be superseded if somebody has maybe a drilling rig offshore that is waiting for a lifeboat and the lifeboat's sitting in Houston and the rig is offshore Angola. So they might have to hire a multi-purpose ship to sail straight offshore uh, just to deliver a lifeboat because the rig cannot operate until they have their lifeboat on board. So but there's other circumstances be. where the value of the cargo is very low, but the penalty for not delivering it uh -huh. is very high. So, you know, paying a million dollars, say, go A to B, um, there's other costs tied to it. Just, I don't want to get too much into the weeds and those things. Uh -huh. uh, so the things that we have to take into account, uh, besides the rent that we owe on, on the vessel, is the bunkers. So that's the fuel that you're burning while you're out at sea or even in port operating the cranes. So if a vessel is burning, let's just say 20, 20 tons a day 
and each ton of bunker fuel costs five hundred dollars you know that's ten thousand dollars a day that you're consuming out at sea and if the if the voyage is 20 days long at sea that's two hundred thousand dollars in cost just to cover the fuel consumptions so we also have to look at our weather routing. Sometimes uh, we see where people will plug it into a distance calculator and it'll say, well, going from Houston to Rotterdam is 20 days straight. Um, well, if it's the winter time in North Atlantic, you know, it might take 24 days because the vessel has to take a more southerly route and maybe we can't do a certain speed because of weather conditions. And the master has to kind of figure that out as he's en route and listen mm -hmm. to the weather routing systems. So we can't always run our vessels full speed with no weather delays. We also have to be able to apply that we might have a 10 or 20% delta on the actual transit time and burn more fuel for this. And that's a little bit more time, more higher on the vessel than we expected. And then once we arrive in the port, you have to pay for the port cost. That includes the pilots, the linesmen, the dockage. There's a lot of other costs that are associated for bringing this vessel in and out of the port. So that has to be included in our overall cost. And then the labor, we have to contract with the labor to load or discharge our cargoes that we're delivering. And in some cases, we have to hire or rent. It could be cranes if uh, for some reason our vessel can't lift the piece, or if we have to hire a, a spreader bar, or we have to buy materials to do weight spreading, things like this. There's a lot of levels that come into this besides just you know saying it costs $8 to load. Well, it might cost $8 to load it, but then you're spending $20 uh you know additional per per revenue ton just to buy some weight spreading materials some d-rings some chains other materials to secure this cargo for the ocean transportation all right so you do what you do is you figure out as best you can what all these costs are going to be for a given voyage and then you take that and you translate it into a weight or measure rate correct that's right okay uh, that, and that's, that's right that's okay that's but, 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 so, Rob, but, but, but Rob um just um, uh, to perhaps uh, to throw a little bit more of a, a light on the on the, the, the pricing um, part of it. You, you explained in a lot of detail um, costing, um, how you cost a vessel. Mm -hmm. uh, but what about pricing? How do how do you under, how do you how do you deal with the the price of opportunity? How do you go about <laughs> sort of price discovery? You know, because of course. You know, MPP. The one, the great thing about MPP is, I think you both, you and I, will both agree, it's not, it's not a tariffed business. You don't look at a menu of prices and say, well, look, he's going from Rotterdam to Singapore, therefore it must be X. You know, we mm -hmm. both know that if, 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 if that if a, that if the charterer, if you that if you need a hundred dollars to get a job done, but you know the charterer will has got a hundred and fifty dollars to spend, you want a hundred and fifty dollars, and you've got That's to right. know that he's got a hundred and fifty dollars to spend, and you want it all. So how do you go about that process of uh, figuring that out? Well, again, we rely on wonderful brokers to help guide us in these scenarios. <laughs> but the, the market is dictating more the value of the vessel than the owners or the operator are. Because we might pay $100 in rent, but the market might say that our subletting of that is worth $200 in rent. Or it could be $50, you know, and then you're losing $50. So would you rather have a roommate paying $50 we are losing $100 or nothing. So these are also kind of some of the decisions that we have to make up. And maybe the $50 guy, we only want him to stay for 10 days of the month because we know later in the month there's a guy <laughs> yeah, that yeah. wants to pay $200 for the other days of the month. So yeah. these are some of the, the scenarios that we rely on. And a lot of it is you're, you're trying, especially in the parceling side, you're trying to take calculated risk. You're trying to see what cargoes are on the market going to the same regions to try to put things together. So hopefully if it costs a million dollars and you get three customers each to pay $400,000, then that's a $200,000 profit. I'm just using rough numbers and ideas, but that, and unfortunately though, if we only get two of the three cargos, then we'll lose $200,000. These are some of the risk and exposures you can have. And that's where it's hard to set a, a fixed costing on ships on the multi-purpose side, because you could be really lucky and you could hit that third cargo a bunch of times in a row, and now vessels are worth a lot more in theory than they were a few months ago. Um, or you could be unlucky several times in a row and you're losing $200,000 a voyage. So it, it's it's hard to peg this cargo is worth, worth this, or this vessel is worth this amount of money in the market because sometimes the market isn't yielding that third cargo that's the top off business. 
if that makes sense. I'm, I don't yeah. mean to ramble um, because it, it and, and, and when you look at indexes for containers and bulkers, everybody, if the bulk index says your ships were $20,000 a day, then the owner is trying to get 21 and the shipper is trying to get 19, right? And in between is the truth. On our side, it's what's available. And I don't know necessarily where, what the other MPP vessels in the market are offering or doing with their ship. And they might already have those two cargoes where I look at the third cargo and I need you know, $500,000 and they're willing to take it for 400 because it complements their other two cargoes they already have in their belly. So you sort of have to reconfigure every time. And you also, and I don't want to get into the, too much into the weeds either, but you also have to think about where the cargo's going and what's going to be there for you to bring back, right? I mean, that, there's, there's, that's right. Loading and discharge issues as well. And, and also dialogue. But, but as Justin was pointing out, it, we have to dialogue with the customers. We have to understand their needs and their requirements because they might have the rig sitting offshore Angola and it has to arrive in 30 days. For a lot, and you, know, you might look at this lifeboat order and say, oh, this will never make sense. They can put this on a flat rack and ship it you know, to Rotterdam and then down to Angola on liner services. But if you don't engage and talk to them and understand that that lifeboat is in a huge hurry to get to this rig, you know, because that rig sitting idle is costing them $10 million a day and higher. So for them to spend a million dollars to move a lifeboat, you know, under normal circumstances, that lifeboat pays $2,000 on a flat rack. But in this circumstance, it has a value of a million dollars or a million and a half dollars to get there as soon as possible. Because every day that it delays is costing them $10 million and higher for a rig that can't drill. Just as kind of an example, which is what, what, what Justin was alluding to, is how do you figure that out? And that's a customer engagement and relying on brokers right. who, who also can help feed this information. So really, so really, MPP is not, it's, it's not, it's, price is not about what is worth, it's, it's what it's worth to the customer mm -hmm. to ship it. And whether, and whether that, that, that value to the customer is, is, uh, is, is, is equal to the value that the ship owner places on that particular vessel at that particular time. Yeah, and dealing with the project side is they typically have liquidated damages for right. erection at site, or they might have cranes sitting on a job right. and trailers that are all scheduled by certain dates. So if they try to take it on the bus service, it'll take 90 days to deliver versus paying a premium to move it on a multi-purpose tramp vessel and make it in 45 days because their job site is sitting there waiting, which costs them money. So maybe a 45, uh, another 45 days out at sea might cost them $10 million just in crane hire, trailers, foremen, crew, just standing around doing nothing. And then to right. clarify, liquid, liquidated damages are when the contractor is like not within the, the constraints of the contract, right? So they have to pay these fee, these sometimes very large fees. That's for, right. For, for like build, right. Mm -hmm. For building a power plant, maybe it's like by January 1, 2022, this facility has to be erected and handing the keys over. And if they, they pass by that, they might have a daily penalty associated with that. And, and if it was all tied to the delivery of the cargo, then somebody's going to get in trouble. Right. Yeah. So all those different pieces have to fit together. What somebody at BBC Chartering once told me, it was like playing a global game of Tetris. And I still think that's really good, really good way to describe what's happening with all these different aspects. All right, we're, we're close to the end of our time, but I want to talk just a little bit about what the jobs are that you do uh, in an MPP office. You know, what does it take to run a, run uh, an operator? And then how, we'll, so we'll do the Justin for that, and then we'll come to Rob for how you guys train people at BBC Chartering. Okay, so Justin, what does it okay, take? Well to run, a, run an office. What does it take to run an office? Well, I mean, it, to takes, run, it, to it, run. it, it, it <laughs> takes a lot. Well, first of all, it takes a lot of flexibility. You know, you've got to be you've got to be, you've got to be willing to uh, to 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 do something one day and then rip it up and uh, and and come back the next day and start all over again, uh, because that is uh, that is something you will frequently come up against in uh, in, in MPP. Uh, so really, that kind of underlines the need for planning. Uh, planning is, uh, is 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 kind of underpins everything in a, in an MPP office, and you know the commercial team needs to know what space is available on the ship, so they know what whatever limitations there are on that space. Sometimes it's uh, you know it's not available all the way through to the end. Sometimes it's been promised to somebody else along the way, da, 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 whatever it may be. Uh, and all the you know all, as MPP vessels carry sh uh, cargoes of all different shapes and sizes. So, you know, it's not unitary like uh, the container vessel. So space is very, very different as viewed as is very, very differently. So so the commercial team needs to be very, very aware of that space and, and, and what it means and, and, and what they can do with it. 
Uh, and there could be obviously limitations, you know, on, on, on the vessel to do with maybe scheduling uh, or, or it could be something technical or regulatory or risk based or something like that. So, you know, you, you've got to be aware of all these things, you know, perhaps uh, perhaps the cargo could take the uh, the vessel through a piracy region, for example. This could be a problem, not necessarily to the cargo that you're going to load, but maybe the cargo that's already on board that might be momentarily uninsured, for example. These are things that you need to be aware of. Uh, and the commercial team needs to work together very closely with an operations team. Um, and the operations team, you know, they, they prepare all the port calls uh, for the vessels uh, and uh, often have to go to very, very where, uh, way out places, sometimes the remote areas of Africa or India or whatever, wherever in the world it may be. But MPPs, just, they just go everywhere. They can find themselves anywhere. And the and, and the and the operations team are responsible for getting the vessels into and out of port safely and quickly. Um, and for that, they need to have friends. These are what we call friends, agents, freight agents with whom they work and prepare these port calls, because often we don't have, you know, uh, uh, officers and own people in those uh, in those locations. You depend on 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 the worldwide network of agents with whom operations teams um, become very closely allied you know they, they they trust the word of the people in the in these places are very important and uh, and 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 it's said i suppose that uh, you know that because time and money is so is so closely linked in in, in shipping and the need to get excuse me ships through ports very very quickly uh is uh, is is very important you could say that the commercial team well they book all the cargoes but the operations team they're the ones that make the money you know, they're the ones that determine whether or not a shipper gets in and out of port, you know, in the time frame that is uh, that is that has been allotted to it and don't spend any extra money whilst they're in port. And the operations team, they have to work very closely with an engineering team. Uh, everything that uh, is is done in uh, in MPP is often is uh, is is uh, uh, is uh, calculated uh, by engineers because it's a very you know, everything's a very very big they can be very different shapes they can be extremely heavy i mean some some cargo is so big you know they're bigger than houses you know they, they weigh hundreds of tons you know and engineers need to figure out and tell the captain and his crew what is necessary for each lift how to lift it where to go and all those types of things so the operations team and the and the engineering team they work together very closely the commercial team the operation team so you know you can see how it is all sort of nesting uh, together and the other thing is that the, the uh, is, is the cranes on ships and why engineering is you know and i don't want to go into uh, into say into the weeds as you say about it is that ships on cranes um or cranes on ships rather um are floating whereas cranes on shore are bolted to the ground. Mm -hmm. So every time you lift something on a ship, what happens? The ship moves. So the engineers need to move, need to, need, need, need to calculate for this because, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, we're working within very, very fine tolerances. Um, and, and, and if something were to go wrong, then of course uh, things can go extremely wrong, very, very wrong. And that brings us to safety. Uh, all MPP officers nowadays, operators nowadays, and, and, and uh, BBC have got a very good one, uh, and that's uh, is, is safety protocols. Everybody works uh, in a safety environment in, uh, in in MPP. As I said, when things go wrong in MPP, they can go very, very wrong indeed. Um, and uh, and heaven forbid, you know, it is extremely rare. And the reason it is rare is because safety is such a uh, such a paramount um, topic in in uh, in in, in multi-purpose and shipping offices like this because every lift is different uh, because every situation is different every cargo stow is different uh, every lift that you do carries a risk with it so everybody in the company is connected with safety in in some way uh, and that is how you know that is uh, you know something that you know it cannot be ignored and it's, it's very very important so when you look through the uh, when you look through the list what you find with an MPP office, I think more so than in other types of offices, is you have this incredible sense of teamwork right from the top, right to the bottom. Everybody is connected in some way and everybody has a, has a role to play, whether it's onshore, whether it's afloat or it's around the world with all the agents. These guys are all coming together in this, in this enormously well connected and well, uh, well drilled team. And I think that's the great thing about MPP, because as I said right at the beginning of this, um, you simply don't know what you're going to get each day. Nothing is unitized. Nothing is nothing is tariffed. Everything is different. And you have to be prepared to throw away today what you spent hours yesterday preparing. Thank you. Thank you. It's very complex, very interesting and uh, unique. And it's a small, a small but very closely knit 
community, the people that do this kind of work. All right, Rob, mm -hmm. before we wrap up, just a, a, a minute or two explaining how you guys train people to get them to the point where they can do this. Yeah, no worries. Uh, just to quickly add to what Justin said, we always say you make money at sea, you spend money in port. Ah. So every time the ship comes to the port, you're paying for something. When you're out at sea, you're not paying anybody. So that's kind of also how we look at things. So the less time we spend in port, the better. Uh, so our trainee program that we do out of the Houston office for BBC is typically we're taking somebody straight out of the university that's maybe around the 20, 22 years old, and uh, they've maybe gone to a maritime school like Texas A&M Galveston, or they've been in logistics, and they're looking to expand their horizon. So we try to make a two-year module where they're exposed to kind of the full spectrum of what BBC does and how we operate. So when, the, when a trainee first comes in, we typically will put them into the documentation department where they're involved with the... Oh, sorry, did it cut off there? There you are. Yeah, so they're in the documentation department where they're involved in the invoicing, the bills of lading, and everything that has to do with the uh, cargoes and what, what we're loading. So that's usually a three-month module. And then they go work for our agent in Houston where they're actually boarding vessels, clearing them in and out of the port for about three months. So they're seeing that ships come in at all hours and uh, all the needs and requirements that the agent has to do. We then will bring them and let them work on the, for the terminal. We have a relationship with Manchester Terminal here in Houston where they're actually working as a clerk where they're receiving cargo and they're seeing how when a, a crate is delivered and there's a damage to it and they have to call the customer and say, would you like for us to, to receive this cargo or do you want to send some packers to finish cleaning this up? Um, so they're starting to see that process. Uh -huh. Then we bring them into the office where they'll work for the port captains where they'll go shadow port captains when they're loading and discharging vessels in the port of Houston area. And they start to understand the processes that go along for operating a ship in the port. And then after that, we'll bring them in, let them do vessel operations where they're ordering bunkers, they're instructing agents, they're coordinating with the terminals because then they have a little bit more, more experience, excuse me. Then after that, we'll engage them into our sales department where they're starting to have more customer contact and trying to see the customer needs and have more dialogue with them. And then after that, they come into kind of the liner chartering side for BBC, where they're actually booking cargoes and putting things together and trying to problem solve. So now they've had a full spectrum of dealing with the agents, the terminals, vessel operations, so they can have kind of a better understanding as to why a vessel is delayed in the Port of Houston or why an agent wasn't able to do something and not just shouting at somebody on the phone. They can maybe understand the processes of what goes on. Are they, are they like a extremely veteran after this point? No, they need more time, but this at least gives them a little bit of exposure to be able to function within the confines of BBC. All right, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. sounds fascinating. All right, thanks Justin and Rob. Um, this has been very interesting. I know that when I started reporting on this sector, it's quite a few years ago now, I found some a lot of this quite confusing and I'm, I assume other people are in the same boat when they try to get it, put a handle on why the multi-purpose world is so different than other kinds of shipping. So um, now I think our audience, our students will be in a better position to understand what underlies decision making when it comes to chartering, break bulk shipping and break bulk cargo. So thank both of you so much. I appreciate your time today and I'll be talking with both of you soon, I'm sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye. Bye.